emotions. Yes. Um, the subsequent mating, mm -hmm. is that also included in the analysis? In what analysis? Well, you are usually talking about uh, a consort male, right? Mm -hmm. And what happened as a result of that particular copulation. Mm -hmm. But then, in many cases, there is another copulation. By the same male? Or by no, subsequent other, other males. Uh, not in, the, in our study of the baboons, there was, oh. there was none. Oh. So uh, we did not observe any promiscuous mating right after, in that 10 minute interval, after a copulation, uh, the female did not, as I said, the guinea baboons have this weird mating system where uh, females are not as promiscuous as other baboons. So there are studies of other species that suggest that this promiscuous matings would occur, but we did not find it in the okay. baboons. Yes. But just to follow up on that side, it's the same question. You do have data that the females who had more than one mate were more likely to call, right? Correct. So can't you tell from that whether the second mating occurred? So if the female called, she was more likely to have another Yeah, we could tell that, that, and it didn't happen. I mean, we only thought, maybe it happens after 11 minutes. We only video recorded the female's behavior for 10 minutes. Oh, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I thought that the graph that was comparing the number of mates that the female had mm -hmm. wasn't just within those 10 minutes. I no, 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 that, you're correct. That's overall in, in the three-month three right. uh, period. But uh, she never made it with more, with two different males in those 10 minutes after she made it with one. So her promiscuity was sort of distributed over this uh, three-month period. Right, but, but you could tell if she mated with him over the three, another male over the three-month period from that the that you have about the total number of mates she had, right? Yeah, you know when she, she did. called and then you know whether... Yeah, but our interest was in uh, seeing whether the, the female mates immediately within 10 minutes after, because if it's really about sperm competition, if she mates with another male three days later, yeah. it's just not as interesting or relevant, right? Okay. I would have thought there would be a bigger window of a couple of days with sperm competition, but... There, there probably is, but uh, we wanted to find a strong effect with an immediacy, not 10 minute window, so maybe we did it wrong. Maybe we should have watched for a few hours. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so as far as I understand it, the model predicts that in species with um, conspicuous advertisement population, when females are infertile, there should be no copulation calls, right? I mean, there doesn't seem to be, unless, you, unless I missed it, there's no explanation for why females should call at all when they're infertile because there's no paternity confusion and males don't gain anything from guarding because the copulations don't result in pregnancy. Right? So I'm wondering if you can comment on those females that the small percentage that do call when there is no chance of okay well first of all uh even when the female is not fertile uh there's always some chance of fertility and uh, uh, uh and, this, and the signals that that convey information about fertility they do so probabilistically so when females made outside of their fertile period the probability of fertilization is low, but there's still some. Right, well that's that's why I said in species with this conspicuous advertisement, because presumably when it's flat, it's not like, oh, there's still a 10% chance. It's, look, they ovulated somewhere where it was where it was really high swollen, and when there's no advertisement, it's not like there's some chance that ovulation is going to occur there, right? And males should be aware of this, presumably. Um, okay, I just had a conversation with Bob Marty, and I hope you, everybody know. Bob Martinez, who told me that he's come across an old paper that shows that in humans there is some chance of fertilization every day of the cycle. <laughs> so they, I don't know how they did the study, but essentially they collected data day by day uh, and showed that even 20 days away from ovulation day, there's some low probability. As you can see, the females mate with the males when uh, uh, when they're flat and they're swelling. Uh, so there is, I think, opportunity still to confuse uh, uh, paternity, for example, uh, you know, by mating promiscuously. Uh, even if a female is not fertile, essentially she's distributing paternity, at least in the minds of, of the males. So why, why not uh, take advantage of that? Um, and if she mates with a male that she doesn't like, 
at all, like a subordinate male, a low-quality male, even if the probability of fertility is very low, then it's in her interest to call and encourage other males to mate, because otherwise that male will monopolize that very low chance of paternity. So it's in her interest to spread that among other males. Right, right. I was, I was just, I was under the impression that um, there's a very small window in which these, the egg is viable, and for the rest of the cycle, it's, it's essentially no. But <clears throat> that's an empirical question. I mean, I don't I'll know. have to look up this paper that Bob Martin told me about. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm wondering about your resistance to the idea that um, species will reveal fertility status in the calls. Um, and in that simple paper, the um, the male response actually did depend on whether or not they're the female was fertile or not. It wasn't just that they responded to the population calls in general. Because he showed that the, the population, population calls were acoustically different. And that the males recognized the difference. Right. Um, there's also a new one with pandas that just came out. Oh, okay. that, where the males can hear the difference between the low. Now, I'm not sure their population calls actually. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. just but I'm just wondering, I mean, how would you adjust your model given that? that right. Know, yeah, if we're wrong, then we would have to incorporate that uh, variable, the fact that there's some information about fertility as well. As I see it now, uh, it's not necessary. And also, because females call when they're not fertile. Right. If that's correct, then you would have to assume uh, that females are cheating also. They're calling when they're not fertile. Whereas the model right now does not uh, require that extra assumption. Okay, so the female are calling, because they made it, they made it, and so they're being honest. They're just advertising. Sometimes they choose not to advertise, but they're never doing false advertising, right. which was something that would happen if that were true. But you were mentioning that the calls are more effective when they happen in conjunction with the sexual swelling, right? Well, you saw, yeah, the data of male behavior. Yes. Right. So some, couldn't the, couldn't the, the vocalization be just the similar thing as a sexual swelling? Well, then why would the females need two signals that are totally redundant? Well, I mean, macaques are in a sexual spelling, right? So there are, there's some, yeah. And Barbary macaques are there. Yeah, are there? But not all macaques. Not all macaques, but not all macaques show population calls. Right. Okay. Maybe it's just because I heard a confusing talk about signals, so I'm confused. <laughs> okay. No, it's all my responsibility. I'm not sharing it with <laughs> Um So as I understood. Some, two of the core features of the argument. Um, uh, females stand to benefit by uh, inciting males to mate guard when those males show other indications of quality, size, rank, what have you, um, and thereby the female increases the certainty of conception with the chosen male. But um, if rival males manage to displace that male, um, then uh, she has a sort of a second recourse in the form of sperm competition with the reproductive tract, right? Mm -hmm. And with this as a background, if I understood the prediction correctly, was that you expect if the, if the agenda includes inciting mate guarding, um, that females should call more with high range of males than subordinate males. But it seems to me that a simple strategy is um, just call all the time uh, regardless of the quality of the male. Um, and then, just as in the case of competition within the reproductive tract, let the guys duke it out. Okay? So I don't need to attend to the male's rank. Um, if he is high ranking, um, then he successfully defends in, in mate guarding competition, what I call. And if he's low ranking, um, then uh, he loses, and a male who is more likely to be successful in that regard by virtue of the fact that he has displaced the rival, um, uh, has an opportunity for competition with the reproductive tract. So why does the mate guarding idea, I mean the mate guarding idea is very intriguing, but why does it predict um, uh, contingency on male rank? Okay, first of all, if the female called all the time, uh, every time she mates, that would imply that she calls even after she mates with subordinate males during their fertile period. <coughs> Uh, now, because everybody will hear the call, obviously the alpha male will not like that, to find out that she just made it with a subordinate male, so there's a cost of calling. Uh, uh, when uh, uh, 
the male, the female has just mated with the, with a male who's not a chosen male. So by calling most of the alpha male, for example, she's essentially telling the male, I'm just mating with you because uh, you never hear me call, so I just don't mate with others. Whereas if she called every time, she would tell everybody, including the alpha male, that she's very promiscuous. So this would go against her attempt to concentrate paternity in the alpha male. She would make it very public that she's very promiscuous. And so this would reduce the, the, the alpha male motivation is dependent on the confidence of paternity. So the alpha male will be willing to protect the female's infant and also and even engage in mate guarding if he has a good confidence that he's pretty much the only male that mates. So if the female advertises mating with all the others, then he knows that she's promiscuous. Okay, so that, that there are two engines driving the behavior that one is um, uh, infanticide risk subsequent, right. okay? Right. And the, the second is that diminishing returns to the alpha male of mate guarding as a function of his information about her prior promiscuity? Correct, exactly. So by, in, so we reassume that, that the choice that the female makes at the moment of uh, encouraging mate guarding is mostly a choice for infant protection. So the alpha male is supposedly the male that guarantee the best protection. If he doesn't, if he's not effective in guarding the female because he gets displaced, then it means he wouldn't be an effective infant protector either. So that's selection against a, a bad infant protector. Uh, so if the female is choose, pursuing that strategy of concentrating paternity in the alpha male by calling, then she has to convince the alpha male that he has very high confidence in paternity. Uh, if she calls when, uh, uh, when she mates with him, essentially, she's being honest. She's saying, you know, um, you know, I'm giving you the chance to guard me, and protect your investment. So, but if she has any interest in confusing paternity and mate with others, then she's better off doing that surreptitiously. Essentially, she can mate with every subordinate male behind the bushes and let every subordinate male think he's the father, without letting the alpha male know that. So she won't pay the costs of reducing the alpha male's confidence of paternity. Yes. So I'm wondering if you can use the same data set to test this alternative, one of the alternative hypotheses about female-female competition. So did you check to see about how the number of simultaneously receptive females influence the likelihood of calling? Or could you with this data set? The number other... Uh, with the one that we picked in the CACs in, in the wild, yes, we could. Uh, with this one... Uh, it wouldn't make a lot of sense because of the weird harem uh, structure. But there's multiple females within a harem yeah, that could yeah. be receptive, right? Yeah, and maybe some of them were secret. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, just the odds and, are... And the expectation would be that... Uh, well, I mean, I think that it would be nice to have female receptors that would be able to also use other things. I just wondered if the data set would also support that that could be But if the main function of the calls is to monopolize a particular male and make sure that, for example, for the three days that the female is ovulating, the male only mates with that ovulating female, wouldn't the female be better off just calling all the time during those three days? Why wait until right after mating? If the function of the call is to keep the male close for whatever reason, then the female should wake up in the morning and call and don't stop until midnight and do the same for three, four days. Why call after mating? Well, that's a logical explanation of why that doesn't make sense. Would it be nice to have an empirical demonstration that in fact they're not doing that? Right, but, but logically it seems that the timing of the call really suggests the function of sperm competition because the female-female competition would not, I'm not, I'm not I'm speak not, to that timing. I, I think that's you know, perfectly reasonable, but it would also be nice. Yeah, just yeah it would be nice. It would be an interesting down, piece of extra. Not only does it not make sense to you, it apparently doesn't make sense to them either. <laughs> that would be nice. Sure. Um, the, the, your model seems uh, a bit vague on the relationship between male 
rank or competitive ability on the one hand and male quality as seen from a female point of view on the other. And so, you know, when I think about, about Japanese macaques, there's a species where there are there's female population calls, there's risk and fantasize, it seems like it you know, ought to be fit into your model. Um, Joseph Soltis found that if you looked at the sire of each infant and then, you, then, then to, for each female ranked all the males in the group by how much she maintained proximity to him, it was about half the time the case that the sire ranked higher, often much higher, in the, the, the female's attraction to him than in, in dominance rank. Mm -hmm. and the reason for these kind of idiosyncratic preferences we don't know, we don't. right? You know, it could be genetic compatibility, who knows? But, but it, it does seem like um, this, bla this black male process, it, it, only, it only works if the, if the male that's just been populated with is effective at, at mate part. So, so, right. is it, so, so is it a prediction then that if a female is mated with a male that she prefers but is not going to be effective at mate part, she shouldn't call? That well, yeah. I mean, the idea is that uh, if you have a situation of uh, high female promiscuity, where a female mates with all the males in the group, that sort of automatically says that mate guarding is not effective. I mean, really highly promiscuous species, essentially, either there's no mate guarding or mate guarding is not effective. Mate guarding is effective in species where a few males manage to effectively monopolize the females when they mate guard. If it wasn't effective, they wouldn't do it. In fact, I think in species like uh, chacma baboons uh, that are highly promiscuous, where females call all the time, there is almost no mate guarding. So the idea is that uh, uh, the copulation calls are to be expected uh, uh, in situations of high promiscuity. But in, that, in this situation, then, the female is calling just for sperm competition. And the, the, the influence of these variables, obviously, there's trade-offs. Mm -hmm. So in a situation of really high promiscuity, the effect of mate guarding is not expected. Right? So when a female mates with all the males, and she calls all the time. Essentially, she's just doing it for sperm competition. Okay? So, as you remember, the curve for the copulation calls had a peak in the middle. So, uh, the copulation calls were, in terms of infanticide alone, and made guarding, they were expected to be highest for intermediate values of female promiscuity. That's when made guarding can be effective. When you move towards the, the right of the, uh, of the, the graph, where there's very high values of promiscuity. We, as, we assume that the population calls there are driven by sperm competition because the curve for sperm competition was basically going left like this, do you remember? So essentially we expect that uh, pressure from risk of infanticide mostly affects population calls through the mate guarding mechanism for intermediate values of promiscuity. For low values of promiscuity, essentially it's all concentrations of paternity where there's no even need for population calls because the female is monogamous. For extreme high values of promiscuity, the call simply incites per competition. And there is no effect of paternity concentration. Make sense? Okay, so in other words, there's, so as I understand them, there's, there's nothing in the model for the possibility of concentrating females pursuing a strategy of concentrating paternity in a male that is not uh, a good high competitive ability. Uh, aside from dominance rank, yeah. yeah, there's no good genes in the model, yes, okay. basically, yeah. Uh, we assume that, uh, remember the assumptions were either females can't identify the male with good genes, or they don't have the opportunity to choose. So this is a model for species in which female can't choose uh, uh, a male with good genes, because otherwise that the, that the selection would all happen at the pre-copulatory stage. Okay. It seems to me that, the, I mean, adding more, you know, gears in the machine, but for variables in the equation, but it seems to me that this, um, exactly that curve that you've just reminded us of, addresses the possibility that Joan raised. So if um, I'm a female in a species in which um, there is... So this uh, was the curve for, its, right. for infanticide. So, Right. So in the right. middle area of that um, curve where I expect males to mate guard in response to population calls, mm -hmm. right, um, uh, and um, if there's female-female competition, mm -hmm. right, then um, males are only going to mate guard um, in response to population calls when they've actually copulated with the female, right? So if the female just 
you know, the mail says, you're sitting on a rock over there calling, and you know, I haven't seen you in a while, then um, uh, I'm not going to make you in that circumstance. So if the female selectively calls with high-ranking males and males mate guard in response when mate guarding, uh, when, when copulation is paired with calling, then it's an, it's an honest signal to other females that that male has been depleted, right? So it would, in that context, reduce other females' um, incentive to attempt to mate. So conceivably then prolong other females' opportunities, or, or rather, rather prolong the duration in which they delay prior to seeking out the high-ranking male. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if they're under time pressure because of um, limited fertility windows, then they, they mate with a less desirable male. So I don't see that, that this is actually incompatible. Your response to Joan's suggestion was, well, then females would just call all the time, and that would you know, you know deter other females from, from um, being proceptive. But not if females know, know in whatever sense they know, right? that um, uh, high-ranking males who have just copulated are likely to mate. Right. You could also have a different explanation that also involves females, which is that uh, assuming that the male is not necessarily depleted, he can copulate again. Uh, by calling, the female could say, oh, I just found a good male, and I'm advertising that I've just identified a good male. In many animal species, there's copying of mate choice. So that would be an incentive for females to come and mate with this male because, oh, our friend there just discovered a good male and she just mate with him, so let's go and do the same. If the male is not depleted, that would be a, an argument that would result in... that. You would expect that in situations in which the female doesn't benefit from mate guarding because, I mean, you need some right. inclusive fitness or other explanation for why she would care about the choices of other females in terms of enhancing them. But if, if, if she's encouraging other females to mate with this male, then she's reducing his ability to mate with her because he's got a time allocation problem. Right. But you'd need synchronous fertility in females if it was going to be a, a, a female competition issue. Um, well, I mean, you need some synchrony if there's ever any argument for strategic depletion, right? But it doesn't have to be complete synchrony. There just has to be, you know, sufficient probability of conception across two females within the same day. I mean, I don't know how long the mate, males mate guard. I don't know. I, I mean, this gets back to your earlier question about what those windows consist of. I was wondering if you uh, would want to uh, speculate on how your model might be applicable to to humans in singing or post copulation. Or I know nothing about female population. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might imagine that, that there could be. So your prediction is that you know in situations where there's a lot of female choice, you expect selection actually be operating on the front end, not the back end. So you really don't expect this, but you might imagine that there's well, between population differences and the extent to which women actually have choice on the male, right? And there might be inter-individual differences within such you know, the extent to which you feel when you feel that they are in fact. You know, empowered to be able to make that same kind of game choices. Mm -hmm. So you could imagine that something like this could be act like back or you know, right? or perhaps just enacted, you know, through a series, you know, <clears throat> through a series of um, you know interactions between the environment and past phylogenetic nurture. This was the particular powerful way back in you know, pre-human evolutionary history. Right. Yeah, this is all fine except for the fact that the model really rests on the assumptions that uh, copulation calls evolved in species where there is high risk of infanticide and intense sperm competition. And so if you look at you know, the ratio between testicle size and body size in humans, that doesn't suggest that humans have ever been subjected to really intense sperm competition. In terms of risk of infanticide, I don't know if it's ever been a factor. But you would have to demonstrate or at least assume that these pressures exist or existed in early human history. If the function of population call is the same as the one that I hypothesized for the data primates, then we don't know. Yes? So the model rests on this idea that sperm competition reveals genetic quality to some degree. Awesome. I don't know this, but sperm motility doesn't seem like the kind of character you think of as as, you know, 
it doesn't integrate over all the developmental genes, all the stuff that you would think would be the kind of candidate for a sexually selected signal of, of quality. Is, it, is there any evidence that, that uh, females that mate with more than one male have more fit daughters, say, or anything like that? Or is this, so what's the other? Well, not, not in primates. I don't know. Whatever benefits are thought to arise from sperm competition, whether well, you can see why sperm competition arise once you have multiple populations, but the question is, do females get any benefit by recruiting extra males in terms of the fitness of, the, of their, their daughters especially? Well, that? they may get benefit from their sons though, right? That is, if, if, even if it's not integrating across a wide variety of traits, if just, say, ejaculate volume or motility are yeah. heritable, right? Well, if nothing else is uh, insurance again, uh, against the male sterility, I, one studied a group of macaques where the alpha male was mating a lot, but it turned out that he was sterile. He was shooting blanks. So if the female that had, makes sense. right, That's fertility not. insurance, right? Um, it's one of the reasons why females are promiscuous. If they put all their eggs in one basket, only mate with the alpha male, they might run into a sterile alpha male and never have a kid. You know? Of a male that's going to be killing your infants hearing a population call that you're making is basically right. slipped enough. Well, the risk of infanticide is high for new males who recently immigrated into the group because the chance, their chances of probability of paternity is low or not existing. But in, in theory, uh, the same can be said also for a resident male who simply has never made it or has never made it with a particular female who has a baby. So the crucial variable, I think, is not how recently you have immigrated, but whether uh, your chances of being the father of the infant are high or low, which depends on whether you were around at all, or, and also whether you made it with that female or not. So I don't know that there are good data comparing infant side by resident versus immigrant males, and also in relation to the timing of immigration, but it, it seems pretty well established that the lower the confidence of paternity, the higher the risk that the male will commit events. Yeah, yeah, and I, I understand that that's well established. But you know, like in a zoo group, for example, if mm -hmm. you know all of your risk of events that has to be coming from within the group. But I would assume right. that these males are not constantly killing infants because that's not a very popular. <laughs> People don't like to watch that at the zoo. So. Um, um, I worked in a primate center, which in many ways uh, you can compare to a zoo. The monkeys were in a large uh, outdoor enclosure and. Uh, a lot of the males was committing infanticide. Uh, uh, it wasn't the uh, the alpha male. It was another male, and they had to take him out because he had tried to kill two of the three babies. Later. And so it does happen in captivity. Uh, yeah, I I was just curious if you had statistics. Okay. Thank you very much for this.